Just waiting for the go ahead from Charles. We've had to fiddle around with a few different settings here to get this streaming okay, but um, we're worried that there could be bugging issues happening with things dropping in and out. So my apologies if things do bug in and out, but I'm recording this now. So if it's terrible, then you'll be able to uh, at least catch up uh, some of what I'm saying in a better quality video that's storing straight to my hard drive and not saving over the magical interwebs. Um, I'll just double check, we're good to go. I think we're good to go. So I am, uh, we're, we've moved on, we've covered uh, a few different things, including what art is. We've looked at what color is and how to use color. Uh, we're also gonna think today a little bit about the idea of how to judge art. And we're gonna look at sort of this three-dimensional structure of uh, judging art. And I thought in this uh, space, it would be fun to be in my studio because we're in my studio that, that that's happening. So you can blame me and not, and not Charles. Um, in the meantime, like as we're talking, one thing that I'm curious about is what, if you can remember a time in which you looked at a work of art or at least something that was supposed to be a work of art and you thought to yourself, that's really not what I would consider a good work of art. And I want you to have a think about that and maybe chuck in the chat why you think you decided that it wasn't good art. What was sort of the basis of it? Um, I'm really keen to know what you, how, how you maybe made uh, that decision. So that's what we're thinking about. We're thinking about how to judge a work of art. And here's an old friend of ours, Jackson Pollock's Blue Poles, number 11 from 1952. Uh, it's, so basically, Jackson Pollock painted this and then went to the, the National Gallery of Australia, purchased this work, and in doing so, really, um, there was a huge scandal that, that erupted around the purchase of this because it was the first painting ever sold in the world for over a million dollars. Um, and that meant that uh, people in Australia that were concerned about tradition and concerned about the value of the Australian collection, uh, it basically meant that uh, they thought that Australians were wasting money by buying this work of art. So they were concerned that it was uh, a number of things, that it, that it wasn't art, they thought it was uh, just splatters of paint. Uh, they were concerned that maybe it wouldn't last very long. Uh, so it was made of enamel and aluminium paint with glass on canvas. So they weren't sure if it was going to actually uh, last the test of time. And they were concerned that um, basically it, it just meant that things looked completely uh, ramshackled and random to the point where if this was art then art could be anything that's obscene and so there was this kind of worry that this was an obscene thing an obscene image let's see if um, yes apparently there is a YouTube stream um, so hopefully that's coming through um, so in the end, the, qu the question was not just is this good art, but it was even is this art? And so how do we then make that uh, distinction? And Orson Welles uh, has this famous uh, film called F for Fake, where he talks about whether something is a fake or whether it's art and what is the difference between authentic art and inauthentic art. Um, And in F for Fake, Orson Welles, you might remember Orson Welles as the uh, amazing author of War of the Worlds, who uh, one night on a radio program started programming a sort of radio drama in which he uh, had all these sound effects and he had this sort of scripted radio callback um, sort of radio play where he was pretending that the world was being overtaken by aliens. and people listening to this uh, on the radio at the time were actually perplexed and actually even threatened and started to worry that seriously that aliens were taking over the world and that Orson Welles 
show War of the Worlds was a kind of live stream of that happening as if um, uh, someone was twitching an alien invasion in radio form. And so he's, he's no stranger to the idea of art and the kind of impact that art can have and then understanding or even thinking about whether something is art or not. Uh, so he's got this great line in this film, this documentary or mockumentary film that he made, F for Fake, where he is, you know, constantly looking at something and saying, well, it's pretty, but is it art? And so there's that question of, you know, we've got on the one hand an idea of there's good art and there's bad art, but then on the other hand, we've got this question of, well, we have art and we also have not art. And so what qualifies for art and not art? And we've looked a little bit at that as well. Um, with that, we have this group of people called art critics who seem to uh, disagree sometimes and absolutely agree at other times around what makes good art and what makes bad art. And so this contestation uh, has been summarized uh, by Jacques Rancière, who's a philosopher, who's looked into uh, a range of different sort of, I guess, perspectives of judging art and determined that art actually comes from a series of sort of ideas around what art should be and how art needs to be judged. So there is a kind of structure in place that we can sort of say, well, if this critic, this critic is related to this critic because they look at art in a similar way. But when you look at enough of them, Ranciere observed that actually all we need is uh, three particular dimensions. Okay, so one of those dimensions is the ethical way of looking at art is so it may be that someone's made a work of art and that that work of art is good for the world okay and then someone else might make a work of art that um, is made particularly well and then someone else might make a work of art that is um, that really feels like amazing and and really feels beautiful and so this idea of beauty uh, falls under one stream called the aesthetic regime uh, that Ranciere identifies. Um, so we have an ethical, we have a poetic, and we have an aesthetic. And so these are all grounded based on theories that philosophers have uh, set up over time. And they kind of start with uh, Plato, who developed his theory of what art is based around an ethical position and he determined that because um, philosophers generally they're, they're really interested in truth and wisdom and they want to find out as much about truth and wisdom as they can and so they write about truth and wisdom and what's really interesting about art is that art has this strange relationship with truth because on the one hand we have uh, we believe that art is um, a thing, that it exists in the world. I have behind me a series of paintings and these are material things in the world. Um, or are they just paintings? And does art even exist? So philosophers, particularly people interested in ontology, think through this idea of what exists and what doesn't exist. And does art even exist or is art just this fiction that we've created and labeled certain objects that uh, don't, that, that the objects exist, but the art necessarily doesn't. And because they're, they're interested in what exists and what doesn't exist, then there's also the question of what is an artwork's relationship to truth at all? And Plato was really troubled by the idea of art because he thought that artworks deceive us and so he had this idea that if there is a table the person who understands the table the best is the maker or is God actually God understands tables the best but then you have furniture makers that make tables and they understand instances of, of tables so they understand 
examples of tables that they have seen. But between, say, God and the furniture maker, whereas God understands and knows everything, there's this sort of ideal table in this ideal place. And the furniture maker sort of transmits and get, collects some of that information and uses some of that information to make the table. But then an artist who paints the table knows l even less than the furniture maker when, making, when painting a table. And so what they're painting is they're painting a third removed from the truth of what tableness is. And so Plato thought that was actually a problem and that artists should be banned from the Republic on that basis. And when thinking through that, artists who are um, painting things, uh, he, Plato was basically saying that artists were lying to us and that we needed to um, ditch them. And yes, uh, Shui, idealism and materialism, that's exactly right. Um, and yes, Charles, we're definitely doing object-oriented table creation. So I'm really thrilled that there is some sense being made of this in case this, is, this stream is really choppy. Okay, so yes, we, we have these layers of ideal instances and then the illusion of the instance. And I guess here we're thinking about forms of abstraction. And when you're making objects in code, you're probably going to be thinking of, you know, you'll create an object uh, and that object will be an instance, you know, you'll... you'll set an object to draw, you'll draw an object, but that object will be defined uh, by a very different series of abstractions in a, another piece of code elsewhere. So you call on that object uh, and instances of that object in your code. And so it works in a similar way to how Plato was thinking of the ideal realm and then the material realm, but then art itself was a problem because it was a reflection, like a mirror reflection of a material realm and the material realm was a reflection of the ideal realm and that when we had these too many reflections we were too disconnected from truth and maybe you feel like that today with um, Instagram or fake news or whatever and Plato had this example where he it was a thought experiment and we know it as Plato's cave and imagine that you're living in a cave and you've never gotten out of the cave but there are these shadows that are projected on the wall and they're the only interesting thing that happens in the cave. And you watch these shadows and sometimes they look like people doing things and you start to think, oh, these are gods, these are um, magical things. And so you become fixated on these shadows. But, in, but the cave is actually just a cave away from the world and outside the cave is the actual world going on. So Plato used this as an example that if you only ever knew the shadows in the cave, you would think that the shadows were real, but actually the shadows are just shadows. And that if you ever tried to get out of the cave, the light would be so blinding that it would be so hard for you to see the truth. And so he had these ideas about having to go through the pain of uncovering the truth. And that's what makes him a philosopher. And there was a lot of plays and tragedies written in ancient Greece that Plato was looking at and he was thinking about um, the effect that this had because he would notice that sometimes people would cry or people would have like strong emotional reactions to a, to a theatre production and he thought that that actually weakened people so he thought that that would be a disadvantage for soldiers to um, see a play and be moved to tears because soldiers should be stoic and they should be ready to be warriors and and fight in the world. And so here's a really strong kind of argument about why art is bad for the world. And occasionally, as we'll see in this lecture, we find examples where, we, where a critic chooses to dismiss an artist and the artist's work based on the, uh, based on the fact that uh, it's a lie, based on the fact that it may be offensive, based on the fact that it may be um, actually damaging or destructive or defamatory or a whole lot of things. Um, so we do come to visual culture in this way. Um, one other uh, way that you might have noticed uh, 
is in the way that images can create stereotypes. Um, there's a typo there. Images can create deceive. No, images can deceive. So in, world, in the lead up to and in World War II, uh, there was a proliferation of images that circulated Europe. And these images were really dehumanizing representations of Jewish people. And what they did uh, to make these images was that they relied on certain kinds of shortcuts that were familiar to um, you know, prominent Jewish people in the population, but then they would bend and twist those features and make them sort of animalistic or monstrous. In this image in particular, you can see that this image takes away all of the color of the figure. And the figure is um, sort of this zombie looking thing. And the figure is holding money. And in the other hand, it's holding territory. So by creating these, um, these kinds of images, and this is just the poster advertisement for a um, exhibition of propaganda images that created stereotypes of Jewish people. Through these stereotypes, people started to shortcut and understand and download highly dehumanizing beliefs about Jewish people, which then allowed military uh, genocide of an entire range of people. So it's not that Plato was wrong. In fact, Plato was very right in many ways, and troublingly so. Uh, so in, in which case that's a problem for us as artists because we actually have quite a responsibility when we make something to ensure that what we do make is considered and um, not going to lead to such horrible uh, atrocities uh, as propaganda and stereotypes often do. A little closer to home, uh, Liz Connor wrote an article for The Conversation not too long ago where she was at a pub in uh, Fitzroy in Melbourne and she spotted a whole range of things called Aboriginalia, which is sort of souvenir kitsch artworks uh, displayed in the hotel. And, you know, some of them were displayed in the toilets and others were displayed, you know, pride of place in the, in the um, pub. And so, what happens is that we can see here this inframing of an Aboriginal person that is a stereotype, but also it directs, it, it sort of asserts that there is a certain amount of relevant information about this person. And this is a highly sexualized uh, image that is a deceit that Aboriginal people are these things that we can conquer and that men can, you know, lust after and that men can own and, you know, s you know satisfy their own consumption uh, with these people and that they will even enjoy this, right? So racism uh, can be combined with gender uh, sort of stereotyping that can be very harmful because it creates these beliefs in us about, or can create these beliefs in normal people um, that, you know, these people are not necessarily um, some dimensional things. And the risk is that they can be seen as that. And also that they can see themselves as that. So representation is, um, is politically loaded. And I wanted to... Um, so, so now what I'll do is I'll sort of quickly go over Aristotle's view of poetics because Aristotle was uh, Plato's student and he said that he wrote a book called Poetics which is a really fantastic um, way of countering Plato's criticism of artists and in particular he criticized um, the, the idea that art is bad for people and he took Plato's idea about warriors looking at Greek tragedies and he said actually when a warrior is moved to tears this is a really important therapeutic moment for that warrior 
that is going to make them better in combat later. And in Poetics, what he did is he wrote down how to make a play. And, and in this modern day, we can think about how to make a movie or a TV box set or a Netflix and chill binge. How, you know, how do you make a story arc in such a way that the effect that it has, has a cathartic release for us so that we can actually uh, go into a film with whatever tensions and anxieties that we have and we can come out of that film healed of those tensions and anxieties. Um, so his letter was, his text was to, our, to Plato to say, actually Plato, while what you're saying is true and while artworks are lies, they are good lies. They are lies that can be really helpful. And he, the way that he said that artworks are lies, Aristotle says that actually they're not lies, they're one lie, they're the first lie is a lie. And he said that if we think about uh, any kind of story or film, it starts in the start of the film, it starts with one lie. And maybe that one lie is that there is a character called Trevor. And that everything else that results from that one lie is actually a hypothetical truth that derives from this one lie. But the important thing was, was that Aristotle told us that although art can be bad and can be problematic, he said, if it's made well, it can be magical and therapeutic and healing and give us a sense of catharsis. And catharsis would later come to be the term uh, used by psychotherapists when patients were healed. We now think about the idea of the breakthrough moment and the breakthrough, you know, is, is a sort of sense of catharsis where we um, exp expunge all of our demons. Um, so Jaws is a really great example of everything that Plato talked about. Um, and Jaws does this thing throughout the film where it has this heightening of tension. If you've ever watched the film Jaws, you get tenser and tenser as the time goes on and there's a soundtrack that builds tension and that's a really important part about catharsis. Um, Jaws was based on one lie. That lie is that sharks are vengeful and out to kill us. And in particular, this kind of shark, this great white shark is vengeful and out to kill us. Now, Jaws came out in 1975, when at a time when there were very healthy shark populations. Uh, and it was based on a book by the same name. And the author of the book was so distraught by the effect that Jaws had as a book on shark populations. Straight after Jaws came out, there was a huge proliferation of people that went and fished great white sharks or any kind of shark that they could because they, they suddenly had the belief that sharks were human killers and that they were out to kill humans. But it's not the case. In Australia, we have about 10, sharks, um, 10 shark attacks that are fatal every year. Um, there's a lot of sharks around. They're not out to get us. But when you create a film that's horrifying where the demon is the shark, we see a kind of pattern occurring where a scared audience, like, um, you know, in, in historical examples, a scared audience is unified around a common enemy and then that common enemy goes out and, you know, th these people go out and hurt uh, that common enemy. So that was something that the makers of Jaws didn't quite realize as they were making it uh, but the author then went on to be a shark activist um, forevermore now so jaws starts with that one lie but there are, there's a philosopher named uh, slavoj zizek and there's actually a really great film that he made called um a, uh, a idiot's guide to cinema a pervert's guide to cinema i should say and he talks about this film and he says something very interesting about it he says that What's amazing about this film or films like this is that they can take beliefs about all these different enemies that we have in our head. So like, you know, maybe you maybe your one of your parents is like 
really stressing you out and making you afraid. Maybe you have an ex that like, you know, is, you know, you can tell is liking things on Facebook. Maybe you, maybe you feel like Donald Trump isn't being as good a president as the world needs American presidents to be. And, and maybe, or maybe you're actually afraid of, of immigration levels, or maybe you're afraid of climate change, right? And whatever, whatever your fears are, what the film does is it funnels all of everyone's fears onto one common enemy. And that common enemy is the shark. And then as the dramatic tension increases throughout the film, all of your anger gets challenged, channeled to the shark. And then at the climax of the film, when the shark is vanquished, all of your fears become vanquished, right? So, and that's because the film is made in such a way that probably follows Aristotle's maps in poetics about how a film should be made. And with that, it then can have a good benefit where maybe people won't worry about things like, you know, they won't worry about their friends or they won't get paranoid about their parents or they won't, you know, fall into despair about politics or climate change. Um, I wanted to include this example because this is an example where uh, these are, this is a work by Tony Albert called Ash on Me. And what he's done is he's taken, he's an Aboriginal Australian artist and he's taken examples of that Aboriginalia kitsch that's been printed on ashtrays that he's found shopping on eBay and shopping in trip shops and antique shops. And he noticed that there's this pattern of ashtrays with Aboriginal faces on them and Aboriginal bodies, where he's imagined that the users of these ashtrays have ashed out their cigarettes on these people. And that that action, every time that they've done that, that action is a racist action. And he's used this visual language to really point out some of these ethical um, blemishes on, uh, say, white Australian history. Um, so we have a coal while we're not dealing with a, a story here, we do have a, a coalescing of form and an ethical position in which we get a message given to us. And this message has an ethical imperative, but it also has a cohesion of a means of being made. So we've talked about the ethical view of art. Um, it may also be that when we think about whether something is well made or not, we might think about photorealistic portrait, for example. And the photorealistic portrait might be a portrait of a very good person, uh, someone who's noble, someone who's done some great things in the world. It may also be really well painted, but it could be really boring, okay? And so what do we do with art, artworks like that? Well, certain kinds of critics are, are going to prefer to think about the ethics of it and others are going to prefer to think about the, how well made it is. But then there are going to be others that think what matters more is about the, the feeling of the work and whether the work really is powerful or impactful or um, at all interesting. Uh, and that comes from a philosopher named Immanuel Kant. And his idea was that beauty is the measure. And in fact, he thought that beauty is truth. Okay, so uh, we can feel whether an artwork is beautiful or ugly, whether it is sublime, whether it has humor, whether it has balance or imbalance or harmony and dissonance. And we can feel that in a work. We can feel, you know, in, in terms of Kant's idea, if something is truly beautiful, we all know that it's beautiful and it's not up for debate. And if something, if an artwork is up for debate about whether it's beautiful or not, then in fact we, um, what, what we find is that either one of the people judging it is judging improperly or that uh, the work is actually not beautiful. Uh, so he firmly believed that we all had this sense of, of truth and beauty. But other critics following on from Immanuel Kant don't just focus on beauty. In fact, many of them actually focus on things like ugliness, and they'll talk about ugliness. And so really, 
uh, the best way to think about this dimension is about the better the work, the more emotional response we can have with it. So it doesn't just have to be beautiful, it can also be um, scary or sublime or horrifying. Uh, and if it is making us feel that kind of way, then you know, that's a dimension in which we can evaluate the success of a work. Uh, one classic example is Caspar David Friedrich's Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog, which is beautiful. It's a beautiful depiction of landscape, of a wanderer in the landscape. Uh, there is a lot of sort of balance in the picture. Um, the colors are, are muted and cohesive. Uh, but also, it's a little bit horrifying because what it does is it foregrounds to us how small we are in the grand scheme of nature. And that can be quite a terrifying thought. But by having the beauty linked to the sublime creates a really profound aesthetic experience. And so now we're talking about the aesthetic dimension when we're talking in these terms. We could, I guess, have an ethical reading of this, that this uh, individual is colonizing uh, this space. They're looking at it as a way to build um, a new territory for their kingdom, or perhaps they're part of the one percent, um, you know, and we can read ethically into the, the tropes of this or a typical, you know, um, we could look at this in a colonial way of, oh, a white man exploring, looking for new territory to take over from other people that are probably going to be less powerful to their modern machine power. Um, these are all possible readings of this, and they, they're all on different dimensions of the um, poetic aesthetic. So just to summarize, most critiques of art, when they critique the ethical side of things, they're, they're usually saying that something isn't good, that it's not good for the world. So they're, you know, if, if they're saying that, then they're looking at it from an ethical standpoint. And the trouble with that is that they may be coming from a different ethical standpoint than someone else, or they might be focusing on different ethical standpoints. Then with is it made well? Is it made well requires some expertise to really judge that. So is something painted well? Well, what do you know about painting? Are you in a position to, to judge that? Um, or sculpture, or um, in our case, code? Or when we think about critiquing art, what can you say about how well it's made? What can you say about how badly it's made? And maybe being badly made isn't a problem if it's really beautiful. So things can be poorly made, but extraordinarily emo emotive. And things can be bad ethics, but be very well made and, and have a really profound ethical um, sort of experience attached to them. And um, I wanted to look at one case who's uh, also uh, a, a new scandal with the National Gallery of Australia. Jordan Wolfson um, has had a work purchased by the National Gallery of Australia for the, for the sum total of $6.8 million. And yet at the time that a lot of people have come out speaking about um, Jordan Wolfson as a narcissistic, um, user of people and you know there's a lot of stories going on about his character but also about the content of his work um, so this is an image this is a digital print an image of a digital print by Jordan Wolfson um, and it, in this we can see Jordan Wolfson's face down the bottom and he's lying down and on top of him is his nude ex-girlfriend and she while they were you know boyfriend and girlfriend this uh, Jordan took this picture, but then she did. Ne she never consented to this work being made, and she only found out about this work when uh, just before she saw it at Art Basel, uh, which is a major art fair. And she walked into a room and saw a naked picture of herself. And um, there are laws around this in Australia, in particular. Uh, I'm not sure about the laws in the United States, where Jordan Wolfson is from, but there are laws around, um, you know, private photographs being shared publicly uh, and there's potential for breaches of privacy lawsuits blah 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 um, and I've included a link in the slides to uh, a documentary which goes into further detail than I can go into here that sort of looks at the sort of ethics of what Jordan does and not just the ethics what's interesting about this artist 
is that he's really playing with aesthetic categories in a way that um, are repulsive to a lot of people and, and also in a way that are um, not just problematic or repulsive but uh, also questionably produced you know so what are they are they are they going to last the distance are they are they even worth the 6.8 million dollars and once we start putting a price tag attached to it the a lot of these issues uh, get foregrounded um, he came to global attention for a work that he made that was shown in the Whitney Biennial uh, at the Whitney Museum in New York and it was a virtual reality work that showed him um, sort of bludgeoning someone to death. It was a fictitious performance of him bludgeoning someone to death and you wore these virtual reality things and you watched this gore and horror. Uh, and so I just want to show you a clip of uh, that sort of from this documentary that uh, explains a little bit about how a critic read this work. And WNYC's art critic, Deborah Solomon, has been spending time up there looking at what's on display, and she joins us now. Deborah, good morning. Good morning, Richard. So was there anything you didn't like? Well, there are a few duds. You um, always have a list of duds, don't absolutely. you, Absolutely. And number one on the dud list, I would say, is a piece by Jordan Wilson, who submits a very in-your-face, high-def video in which he is shown pummeling a man to death oh. as Jewish Hanukkah prayers provide the soundtrack. And I think the piece is supposed to say that the Jewish ritual of Hanukkah is matched by other Jewish rituals, such as violence. And it's offensive, especially at a time when the KKK really is making threats and practicing violence. And I thought that piece was an inexplicable inclusion. Okay, so Jordan Wolfson is a um, is a Jewish American artist, and one of the criticisms that's coming out from this is not just the violence and horror, but there's a pairing of the violence and horror with Jewish ritual. So this idea of taking the the sort of Hanukkah sort of music as a background to this horrible violence, um, and at the same time. It raises these questions about privilege. You know, he's from quite a well-to-do uh, place. What is he trying to do here? Is he actually trying to point out some kind of social injustice of the world? Or is he basically just assaulting the viewer with this horrible experience? And then what does that horrible experience do? Does it move us somewhere to uh, become better people? Does that matter? And um, or is this just sort of a misunderstood work? Maybe it's badly made. Maybe certain things shouldn't be paired with others. Uh, but the aesthetic value of it is quite confusing. The ethical value is, is quite easy to dismiss uh, because of the violence and because of the particular uh, pigeonholing of Jewish culture in this example. Um, so here's a sort of image of what that would look like and, and to make this he uh, used a dummy um, and I think did some costuming and CGI to you know really ramp up the realism of this uh, and he talks about you know everyone has experienced violence but also he's experienced internet violence and um, that this is a that everyone faces if anyone's connected to the internet as we all are because there's beheadings from ISIS and blah 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 Okay, interesting. So, so what do we do with that? Does that become, um, does he turn this into a useful process? And most people seem to think no. And they also, one of the other criticisms that he is um, sort of labeled with is the criticism of uh, whether he actually is using other sort of Jewish stereotypes in other ways. So um, this work here is Animation Masks, uh, which is a video of, um, I'll just, I'll, I can show you a little clip of this one actually. Um, and in this one, we, we also hear his father, um, actually that's gonna download, 
just for a second. Okay, before I jump onto this one, I'll show you this other work, which has a problematic, or at least people have a problematic relationship to this work because of the so sexual that So one is the sense of, of like arousal that I had when I saw like the female body. It's similar to like real violence, the witnessing of violence, a sort of primitive arousal. And then also like the negation of that arousal through the mask. But in general, the foundation of the piece is really the eye contact. And that eye contact is like this grounding effect towards the viewer's body. And it basically... So that's a robot that he um, hired a range of fabricators to make. And in making that, um, he's created this kinetic robot that can make eye contact with the viewer that does so through through this mirror that has a very um, horrific monstrous face is dressed very scantily clad um, but also has is impaled on this thing that looks like a stripper pole right so there's these weird associations that get un, um, ca characterized by critics as misogynistic right so this ethical sort of issue but then if we think about whether it's well made certain things you know it, it looks really ugly right and so is that about the aesthetic feeling that we get from this work or is that about whether it's made well? So thinking through, you know, these three dimensions give us a few ways to triangulate and at least think about whether a work is good art or not. Um, so that was, that was another really controversial work of his. Um, and now I'll, I'll just quickly show you another work of his uh, that was characterized again as anti-Semitic. So that piece, so one is the sense of like arousal that I had when I saw like the female body. It's similar to like real violence, the witnessing of violence, a sort of primitive arousal. And then also like the negation of that arousal through the mask. But in general, the foundation of the piece is really the eye contact. And that eye contact is like this grounding effect towards the viewer's body. And it basically... Sorry, I uh, didn't uh, click the right thing. It's not letting me show this other video, which is a real shame. Um, ah, yes it is. Here we go. Can you tell them what it's like to be with me? Contradiction. How is it a contradiction? You don't know what you want. I don't know what I want. Mm -mm, not out of me. What do you mean? Well, do you know what you want from me? Okay, sorry about that. Let me just um, jump that in and show it to you for real. Will you tell them what it's like to be with me? It's like a contradiction. How is it a contradiction? You don't know what you want. I don't know what I want. Mm -mm, not out of me. What do you mean? Well, do you know what you Okay, so... Um, as you can see, he's using these same Jewish stereotypes that we've looked at earlier. It's this kind of angry looking person. It's a really exaggerated body features that, um, you know, have come to become stereotypes of Jewish, anti-Jewish propaganda. Um, re, you know, really fuzzing out this, you know, kind of religiously um, adorned kind of beard. Uh, but also, you know, it's really clearly looking at Jew, like Jewish men with the addition of the yarmulke. And, um, you know, in, in the documentary, it has a brief interview with the dad who talks about this work. And he said, you know, I tried to talk Jordan out of this because it's just, you know, one of the most offensive things ever. And, you know, so, so it's even uh, his family that are trying to talk him out of it. But then Jordan's coming at it from this position that, um, you know, we can't live in fear. We have to, you know feel free, uh, but, but 
you know, what, what is that freedom doing to the world? Like, what freedoms should artists actually be able to um, be able to rely on? Um, so, with this, this raises a question of, okay, well, at least we're talking about it. You know, we're talking about um, Jewish stereotypes. We're talking about the ethics of art and what art should and could be. You know, and, and it's just pictures. What's the harm? Well, let's pretend that there's no harm, even though there might be. Let's pretend that there's no harm. And let's uh, think about another way that art artists might work with this kind of material. Um, what, what we can say that Wolfson is doing is he's choosing ugliness and he's pointing, he's like in framing certain things as ugly. And what that does is it enables us or forces us to associate those people with ugliness. But let's look at a couple of other artists. And this will just round us out a little bit. Um, th these are two really great examples of artists that use the aesthetic regime and link it really beneficially to the poetic and the ethical regimes. And they are Robert Mapplethorpe and Kerry James Marshall. Uh, Robert Mapplethorpe uh, died of AIDS in uh, 1989, and he was the subject of a lot of controversy, not unlike Jordan Wolfson. Um, but what he did was he photographed people that were uh, not classically beautiful and in a way that's, that uh, wasn't classically represented beautifully. Okay. So this is an image of Lisa Lyon. Lisa Lyon was a female bodybuilder in the 1980s and she was an example of um, uh, a woman who did things, a woman who was physical. Now, art historically, women have been treated as things to look at. As we've seen already, we've looked at the objectification of, um, of women in the Aboriginalia and um, also in Jordan Wolfson's um, ro robotic female figure, where women are objects to be consumed. In here, what we are given is a woman who is powerful. And Robert Mapplethorpe was um, a gay uh, photographer embedded in Bohemia of New York in the 1970s and 1980s. And what he wanted to do and what he ended up doing was in framing queer perspectives on the world but anchoring them in the language of beauty. At the end of this lecture, there's a link to a really great chapter of a book written by David, Dave Hickey, who, who talks exactly about this. And what he says was, before Robert Mapplethorpe made images of queer culture, such as, uh, let's take these images of naked men together, before Robert Mapplethorpe was making photographs and artworks that showed these kinds of people in a very dignified and classically beautiful way. Uh, queer culture was represented in sort of cartoons and quite punk and underground comic book, you know, um, contexts. And that they weren't dignified because they didn't have this sort of powerful structure of classical beauty standards. But what Maplethorpe did was he took something that wasn't given dignity by society and he gave it dignity by making photographs that were extraordinarily um, balanced, beautiful, well-made images. So the ethics here is that he's identifying something that's valuable. People like him and people that deserve dignity. And he's picturing those people beautifully and powerfully. Uh, yeah. And a lot of the controversy, so Robert Maplethorpe ended up in courts for obscenity and pornography. And um, there are some images which, you know, you would look at and they're quite confronting. Uh, but Dave Hickey's analysis is largely that what Maplethorpe did was that he showed conservative people. So there's a quote from a senator in there that says these are just disgusting, obscene. Dave Hickey's argument is that actually Maplethorpe, Maplethorpe's crime wasn't making something obscene. It was taking something that lots of people saw as obscene and making it in a beautiful image. Um, this this uh, 
Hermes is or Hermes is a really important god for the queer community because Hermes is the trickster and he's the um, god of Mercury and Mercury is this mercurial um, sort of fluid substance that never quite hardens and you know escapes uh, escapes labeling um, and so he's really overtly portraying queer culture that he values and Kerry James Marshall is really um, integral, like he, he looks and he learns as much as he can about classical painting in order to make artworks that point at black people, whether they're African-American or African-African, he believes, and um, the statistics agrees with him, he believes that there aren't enough dignified images of black people in museums. And so what he's done is he's set out on a mission to paint dignified portraits of African people, African descended people, and African American culture, and the beauty of what's called in that culture blackness, um, to sort of foreground the beauty that already exists in that culture so that he can normalize, or at least contribute to a normalizing of people seeing African-American people as beautiful rather than as less than the standard of white beauty that is so often um, what, what everybody is, is held to. Uh, and including images of people in clothing that isn't necessarily, you know, like proper evening wear, but reflects the culture of, um, of that community. Uh, and of that st of those styles, so normalizing not just the figures being black, but also the culture as well. And th this is a particularly great image because you'll see this red line uh, coming down the front of the picture. And what he's interested in doing is including little clues about this about black history, so that if you become curious about that red line and you go on and learn about it, you start to learn about all these systematic forms of oppression that were marked out. Uh, which are responsible for ghettoization of, of African Americans in parts of the city and systematic impoverishment by white politicians drawing red lines around certain territories where uh, housing, where banks wouldn't give people loans to buy houses, but it just turned out that's where the African Americans live. Um, I'll skip over this one. And I'll also skip over that one. but. He says that the only way to um, get these images into museums is for him to um, find out what the great masters did. And so he, he studies a lot about what he calls grand master painting, and that is the language of beauty and aesthetics in art history forever. Find, and he says you have to find out what the old masters knew and you have to learn how to do what the old masters were able to do. So you've got to know what they knew and be able to do what they could do in order to be able to compete uh, with them and then find yourself within the arena of what we consider as art um, in museums. And once he's there, what he wants in there is images of African-American people that, are, uh, that look self-satisfied, that are strong, so that we start to read these as strong. Uh, and this is a, a, a wedding portrait of Harriet Tubman. And Harriet Tubman in African-American history is known as uh, a woman who worked really hard to help slaves get freed. And that's all that's really known about her. And so Kerry James Marshall was really interested in adding to her narrative, not making her whole narrative be about slavery, but expanding the dimension of that character into she was a husband, she was a wife of someone as well, um, you know. And here are the kinds of clothes that she wore. So by normalizing, expanding on that history. So I suppose what I've tried to do in this lecture is really to get you to think about a few different ways to interpret things: the ethical, the aesthetic, and the poetic. How well is it made? How, like, what feeling does it convey? And is it good for the world? And then how can you then think about what you want your art to be and do on that basis? And we've seen a few examples where uh, Jordan Wolfson is characterized as a shocking artist who, in quotes, lights a match 
throws it away and just keeps on walking and doesn't care what happens. Uh, and then we have examples of artists that are really thinking through the alignment of um, the impact that an artwork can have. So thinking through the ethic, ethical stance of what they value and thinking how can I, how can I make something to arrive at that ethical stance and, how can, um, and, and what's that going to feel like and how can I give that feeling so that it really lands in the um, people that I want it to land. So we don't really have much time to talk, um, given that it's one minute to four. But what do you think is something that is valuable? If you were to be Robert Maplethorpe or Kerry James Marshall, and you wanted to point at something and foreground something that was valuable, what would that be and, and why? Um, maybe we do have a couple of minutes in the chat if you're able to stick around. Any takers? What do you think is valuable? What is an action that people can take that is valuable? Yeah, Benedict is asking a really interesting question. What about the photo of the girl running with the napalm burns? Uh, so in case you're not familiar with this, this was a really um, uh, famous image of the Vietnam War of a girl who uh, was running with all of her family and she'd, been, uh, she'd had napalm dropped all over her and it burnt and it stung so she had thrown off all her clothes and she was in incredible pain and she was running through the streets and it became one of those iconic photos that moved people to the moratorium marches to try to put an end to the world, right? The impact, the ethics of it is, I suppose, that we're sharing that message, we're sharing that experience. Um, yeah, but as Charles says, really hard to look at and it's hor horrifying. So it's a really interesting counterexample to say the Jordan Wolfson real violence, which is fictitious violence, that he puts the audience in a sort of position of responsibility for or experience of responsibility as a bystander um, that amounts to very little compared to an image of real violence that, that is, is and has occurred, where us as viewers, when we see that in the media, have to think about our complicity in that what is our connection as Australian citizens to the Vietnam War? Um, how complicit are we in that? Great example. Um, I love Benedict Kuzak's uh, Slavoj Žižek, the, the sweaty philosopher on Q&A a few times. So you probably will have seen Slavoj Žižek um, with his really characteristic lisp he loves to tell really racist and sexist jokes as ways to show ideology. So he, uh, to show the, the sort of loopholes of ideology and the, and, you know, so he's a trickster in himself as well. And, and uh, he's, a, he's slippery and he's, he's curious. Um, yeah, I agree, Charles. The idea of the just war is out the window when you start to see the kinds of violence of afflicted on innocent bystanders, children especially. Thank you to everyone for sitting through that. I hope it wasn't too glitchy for you, but we'll have the video up online as soon as possible uh, for you all to uh, clarify any parts that you couldn't quite catch through the stream. Um, I hope you're all going well and feel free to hit me up with a question if you um, have any. Uh, particularly around you know how this content that I'm giving you how maybe it relates to your work if you have any questions about your work and the next assessments um, you know I'm more than happy to to think on that with you